Welcome to the fourth annual Library Webcast, which is brought to this audience through a partnership between the National Center for Families Learning, the Public Library Association, and sponsorship of Better World Books. Two-generation family learning programming is documented to be particularly effective in improving literacy acquisition for individuals from diverse cultural backgrounds and for those living in poverty. Libraries are accessible community institutions poised to support these demographic groups. Libraries are perceived as trusted public institutions and communities, and they have a history of establishing partnerships that enable them to lead activities resulting in collective impact on the education and growth of community members. Libraries continue to reinvent themselves to best serve the families in their areas. No longer are people expected to always come to library buildings to use resources and experience programs. Libraries are providing more and more materials online, and library staff are going to a variety of community venues to meet families where they already are. The libraries represented today are taking their services even further by focusing on family engagement and family literacy in neighborhoods and specialized settings. You're going to hear from both administrators and on-the-ground staff about the good work being done in communities across the country. NCFL is grateful to receive the support of Better World Books, our long-term partner and an international champion for literacy and learning. Like NCFL, Better World Books believes that high-quality education can break the cycle of poverty. Through this sustained partnership, NCFL has provided free online summer programming and hands-on STEM and literacy building topics to thousands of children and through our educational resource, Camp Wonderopolis. We're also really happy to be collaborating with the Public Library Association. PLA's Deputy, Deputy Director, Scott Allen, is here today to moderate this session for us. For the PLA, Scott works on special in initiatives such as family engagement, digital literacy, health literacy, and equity, diversity, and inclusion. Previously, Scott held multiple positions at the American Academy of Pediatrics and served as executive director of its Illinois chapter, where he also managed the Illinois Reach Out and Read Coalition, through which over 100 doctor's offices gave out books to young children. Scott received his BA in English and Linguistics from Northwestern University and his MS in Nonprofit Management from Spurtis College. And I'll turn it over now to Scott for moderating today's program. Thank you, Emily, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm very excited to be here on behalf of PLA. Uh, we're thrilled to be partnering with NCFL, Better World Books, and the Urban Libraries Council on this really exciting and important session. Um, next slide, please. I just want to mention to the people here in the room, we also have uh, over 210 people uh, online viewing us right now on YouTube, um, and that they represent more than half of the states um, and several other countries as well. So we know there's a lot of interest in this topic. Um, there are question forms on your tables, so feel free to jot down questions at any time, and NCFL staff will come around and pick them up. And for those of viewing us online, you can use the comments uh, section on YouTube to pose questions, and we'll be moderating that and getting to your questions as well. Uh, next slide, please. So we are the Public Library Association. We're a division of the American Library Association, and we have about 10,000 members. But really, we consider our audience to be the 9,000 plus library systems and the 17,000 plus library locations across the United States. Um, we really believe that libraries are the heart of their community and they, may, they serve the communities in a myriad of ways, including employment assistance, immigration, health literacy, uh, digital skills, and of course, family engagement. Uh, PLA has only been in the family engagement space formally for about four years when we set up a task force back in 2014. Uh, but this work is all built on the foundation of a project you probably all know very well called Every Child Ready to Read. Every Child Ready to Read took the traditional story times and turned it into a parent and caregiver education program that reinforced uh, learning at home, reading to your child at home, and really changed a lot of how libraries approached that early literacy period. Uh, we recognize, and as Emily alluded to, the potential for libraries to do more in this area across the age ranges uh, is huge. And so we've been working very hard at the PLA level to help libraries with tools and resources to do family engagement. Next slide, please. 
This has led us to develop what we call our framework, the library elements to support family engagement. Um, there's really three major components of that framework. Uh, the first is leadership. Uh, we believe that family engagement shouldn't be something that's confined to the children's and youth services staff, but library directors and boards and other supporters need to be engaged and invested in it. What that means is libraries may devote resources or leverage resources in the community to fund family engagement work. Uh, libraries do professional development and staff training for all staff around family engagement, whether they're children's services or, or adult services or whoever. Uh, that the family engagement is built into the library's strategic plan. So it's not just something that somebody does because they have a really good idea or they're very invested in making community partnerships. It's something that happens across all the library programs. Another element of our framework are support services. And this is really thinking about the physical space of the library. Is it designed to support family engagement? So do you have a chairs of multiple sizes in your story time area so that parents can sit down with their kids. Um, it's also looking at technology in the library and what are the things you need to be able to support family engagement, as well as collection development policies. Are your collections geared towards family engagement? So we're developing resources in all those areas, but the main thrust of our framework are the five R's. Next slide, please. So we've developed these five R's as a way to look across all of your programs and services and try and determine if um, you are really embedding family engagement in all of those programs. Uh, the five R's are, I'm gonna start in the middle here, raise up, so are you elevating the family voice in your programming? Are you asking for input before you develop programs and are you seeking feedback after you do those programs? Reinforce, are all of your programs for parents and kids and caregivers, um, helping them understand that they are their child's best teacher and that there are learning opportunities outside of the library and school throughout the community. Are you really pushing that message home that parents and caregivers need to be engaged in their child's education? Relate, so are you helping parents uh, relate to each other when they're in those programs? Are you helping them develop those critical social support networks that serve them so well when they're struggling out in the community to get things done? Um, are you also helping children and parents relate to each other and parents and families relate to the school, to the teachers, to the principals? So are your programs designed to do that? The last two, reach out and reimagine, are um, sort of what you'd expect, reach out, reaching families that aren't coming into the library, whether it's going out to a, a location in, in the community or actually thinking about a group of people who may not be able to access your services and, and reaching out to them specifically. And reimagine is just being creative, non-traditional partnerships with healthcare providers, prisons, whoever, to try and get to those families. And those are the two R's we're gonna hear the most about today in this session from our wonderful panel of speakers. So first up, we have, uh, for the Nashville Public Library, we have Liz Atak and Clemory Cahigas. Um, Liz is the program manager and Clemory is a family literacy coordinator, so if you wanna come on up. Uh, Liz oversees the Bringing Books to Life program, which is a preschool literacy outreach program. She's on the front lines of helping kids learn and love to read. She juggles story times, trainings for teachers, and reading workshops for parents. Uh, under her leadership, Bringing Books to Life has won local and national awards. Uh, she, has her, she graduated from Oberlin College and holds a master's degree in child museum education from Bank Street College of Education in New York City. Uh, Clem Marie is the family literacy coordinator for Bringing Books to Life. She's a graduate of Stetson University Vanderbilt Divinity School, and she did her doctoral work in ethics and society at the Graduate Department of Religion at Vanderbilt. She's bi bilingual in English and Spanish. So with that, Liz and Clemory, please go ahead. Thank you. So we all know libraries have a long tradition of engaging families, especially families of young children. Um, National Public Library, like so many other libraries, offer story times and programs that really bring those families or those populations into their spaces. Nashville Public Library, again, like so many other libraries, has a rich history of outreach. Um, and my program, the one that Clem Marie and I work for, Bringing Books to Life, has been doing intentional early literacy outreach in Nashville since 2003. Since 2007, we've been providing workshops for um, families and parents um, on early literacy. And in all of our workshops, the goal is to empower parents to take advantage of the, those teaching moments, those literacy moments in everyday life, um, and to get them to use the library. 
So basically our model is to go out into the community and serve people. But what about those who are not in the community? What about those families that are not together? So back in 2015, and I think we might have a slide. There you go. Um, back in 2015, um, a juvenile detention facility in Nashville, it's called Woodland Hills Gateway to Independence, lost their funding to have a school librarian. They have a school on site. Um, Woodland Hills has males ages 14 to 19 um, housed in their facility. Um, so when they lost that funding, they reached out to the Nashville Public Library to our teen services department and asked if we could provide library services. They said yes. So since 2015, they've been going to the facility. They sign up the guys for library cards and they actually hand deliver books and materials to the facility. Um, around the same time, our studio, which is our teen maker space, received a grant to have dedicated staff go to the facility to provide maker workshops like music production, filmmaking, photography, and the like. Um, and so that had been going on. Those were very popular. And they had really developed a nice relationship with not only with the administrators at the facility, but also the residents. But they found out that about 20 to 25% of the guys there identified as fathers. And they felt like there was more that Nashville Public Library could do to serve them. So they turned to us. And they asked if we would be willing to take some of our parent workshops um, to, to the site. And we said yes, because we always say yes. And then we figure it out later. <laughs> Um, but we realized that this was way out of our wheelhouse. Um, you know, it's going to a juvenile detention facility is very different than going to a preschool or an elementary school. Um, also dealing with teenage fathers was going to be different. We really felt like our traditional model of kind of, I do, we all do, then you go home and do with your child might not work. And that also us coming in and saying, let's start with a story. We're going to read Brown Bear, Brown Bear also might not be the best way to reach these guys. So, Clem Marie and I were really trying to figure out what are we gonna do? We actually had the opportunity to go out and visit the site, get to talk to some of the dads, find out what questions they had, what they were interested in, and that kind of start, started the wheels turning. Um, we also um, felt like we had a unique opportunity with our studio um, because the guys had been engaged in creating media and that was something that we'd never been able to explore in our normal workshops and so we thought well maybe there's something that we could do maybe we could make something with the guys but we still didn't know what and so we were racking our brains and then Clem Marie stumbled upon a video on YouTube that we really felt was there was something there. Um, it was really a turning point for us. And so I could go on and on and talk to you about the video, but I thought we could play a clip right now. So let's roll the video. Llama Llama Red Pajama, Luda oh, Chris yeah. is here. Luda. Yeah, man. Of the Furious, in theater, small. Hey, Llama Llama, uh, Red Pajama. Reads a story with who? With his mama, hey. Mama kisses, what? Baby hair. Mama llama goes all the way downstairs, hey. Llama llama, what? Red pajama. Feels alone with who? Without his mama, hey. Baby llama, it wants a drink. Mama's at the kitchen, what the kitchen sink? I'm talking llama llama, what? Red pajama, what? Calls down to uh, llama mama, hey. Mama says she'll be up soon, be up soon, soon. Baby llama hums a tune, hums a tune, tune. Huh. Llama llama, red pajama. Waiting, waiting, what's he waiting for? Waiting for his mama. Mama, is it coming yet? Coming yet, yet? Baby llama starts to fret, starts to fret, fret. Llama llama, red pajama. Whimper softly for his mama. Mama, what you doing? Cause I hear her on the phone. Mama starts to moan. What you wanna do? I bet a mama going home. Llama llama, red pajama. Listen's kind of quiet for his mama, but the llama doing. He's boo hooing and hooing, and I'm screwing. I'm taking it to a dog version. What you doing? Hooing, hooing, hooing. All right, so y'all got a treat. Y'all got to see the whole video. So um, that, as you may know, was Ludacris, the rapper Ludacris. And yes, that was a freestyle of Llama Llama Red Pajama by Anna Dubnik.
So in that video, as you can see, he's having so much fun with the song, with the track, with the beats, and he's really um, making it, making um, the book his own. And in that video, we also discern this deep connection between hip hop and children's books, that the same things that make a hook or a beat good are the same things that make a children's book good, rhythm, rhyme, and repetition. So we decided to use that video as the jumping off point for our work at Woodland Hills Gateway to Independence. And we already knew, as Liz mentioned, that there was, already, there was a lot of energy around the makerspace activities that the young men were doing, particularly music production. That was a big interest about the, uh, among the young men there. And we wanted to use this video as a way to model read-alouds for the young men at the facility. Actually, if you could go back a slide, that would be great. Ah, yes. Yeah. So as you see there, there's Ludacris and Lama Lama Red Pajama. And we wanted to use that video and this video and others like it as a way to model the read alouds in a way that was emotionally safe, not unduly vulnerable. We wanted to show the young men that there's many ways you can share a book with your child. And so taking all these pieces, we decided what we developed was a series of literacy mentor workshops um, for the young men there. The main message we wanted to impart to the young men was that they could be literacy mentors to the children in their lives and as far to the young children in their lives specifically. And as fathers, they had a lot, they had a lot to give. They were in a really great place to have a positive effect to really develop in their children a love of books and a love of stories. So one of the things that we try to do in all of our workshops is that, um, and we want to do for the young men at Woodland Hills as well, was to give them positive experiences with books. So we wanted to give, give them a chance to explore books. So we brought um, close to 100 children's books. Books, fact, if we go to, go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, books with great rhythm, rhyme, repetition, as we mentioned. Books, um, children's books classics. We brought books about fathers and their children. Um, we brought books um, with themes of family separation and incarceration. So we brought a wide variety of books. We wanted the young men to be able to see their lived experience and their cultural backgrounds in the books that um, we brought and in the books that they, in the, in, that, they could, that they could see, excuse me, they could see, wow, there's a wide variety of books that I can share with my child. And so, and actually what they did after that, after, after exploring the books, they then got a chance to work one-on-one -on -one with the studio NPL mentor that Liz mentioned to record a read aloud of um, a book for their, ch for their children. And some of those, some of the young men chose to do more traditional read alouds. Some chose to do it over beats. One young man actually played guitar and still others um, took the books and reworked, their, reworked them, remixed them and um, changed things around and made them their own. And in fact, we're going to listen about a, to about a 30 second snippet of, uh, of a track a young man at Woodland Hills did of this book, Knock Knock by Daniel Beatty. So we could roll the clip. Every morning I play a game with my father, yeah He knock, knock on the door, I pretend to be asleep Till he get right next to the bed Then I get up and jump on his neck Good morning, Papa Then he said, baby, I love ya We share a game called Knock Knock One day he never come knock knock I wait for Papa not here to play Our game called Knock Knock In the morning he never really come to help me get ready for school it never come to cook my favorite food Before school we play April Fools I listen at the door, I never hear the knock Sorry baby, dang dad hit the block Dang dad, did you grab a Glock? Dang dad, did you get shot? Maybe you come by when I'm not home Dang dad, you done left me alone Now I'm sitting here writing a song Wishing dad that All right, so that, that was knock knock um, and so what we did after they did the recording is we burned their tracks onto a CD and then we we put the CDs into a copy of the book that was recorded um, and then the guys were able to make um, um, book plates to go in the books and then we gave them to the center um, to go into their personal belongings so they were able to give it as a gift to their child um, either on visitation day or when they were released um, so hopefully you thought that was really heartwarming <laughs> Um, but, you know, what does it all mean? And like 
the good library employees that we are, we gave the guys surveys after the series of workshops and we asked them kind of what they thought and what they learned and they all said that they felt they had a better understanding of how to help their child to love books and reading. They all said that they felt like they knew more about children's literature. Um, almost all of them said that they plan to visit a library with their child in the future. And they all thought that we should do this again. <laughs> um, and when we asked them what they liked specifically, so many, almost everybody um, commented about what it meant to them that we cared about what they did with their children. Um, and one guy said that what he liked the best was that it gave him a chance to build relationships with new people. And I loved that because that's what outreach is all about. It's our opportunity to build a relationship with someone that we might not otherwise get to. Um, and so I'm going to leave you with a little story. So one Friday, maybe a month, month and a half ago, I was walking through the lobby of the main library at, in Nashville, and a young man was waving at me. And he asked, he said, do you recognize me? And I did. It was actually the young man that you just heard. Um, he had been released on Monday. This was a Friday. And when I asked him what he'd been up to, he said that he had been at the library every day, um, you know, trying to find a job, getting ready to go back to school, and that his plan was to keep on doing that until he got a job or went back to school. And it just made me think about, you know, what, you know, thanks to the work that we did, but also the foundation that was laid by our teen services department and our studio, um, that the library is now a trusted part of his life. Um, and hopefully he'll pass it on to his children. Um, but, you know, we were able to touch not only his, his head, but also his heart and his inside self at Woodland Hills, but also his outside self. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liz and Clemory, for a great presentation and also for getting Llama Llama Red Pajama stuck in our heads for the rest of the day. Um, our next speaker is Jo Goodice from uh, Dallas Public Library. She is the director there. Um, she's been the director for about the uh, last six years or so, working her way up through the ranks from children's librarian, branch manager, and youth services administrator. Um, as the director at DPL, she initiated a homeless engagement initiative, ESL GED classes, a GED testing center, a small business entrepreneur center, and a reinvigorated Dallas Book Festival. So she's been very busy. Um, she had attended the University of Florida for her bachelor's degree in journalism and earned her master's degree in library and information sciences from the University of South Carolina. And I'm very pleased to work with Joe. She's a member of the PLA Task Force on Family Engagement. So welcome, Joe. Thank you, Scott. So Dallas serves a community of, of 1.2 million people over about 340 square miles. You can go to the next slide, please. And we made a conscientious effort to engage families after I got involved with PLA and Family Engagement Task Force. The first thing I did was move staff around so that they were working together. So, you know, libraries are great with children's librarians and we're great with adult services, but to get them seated next to each other and start thinking about doing programs together was a very conscientious effort. So the one with the grace of the city, we were able to roll out English language learning classes in all 29 library locations in the last two years. Um, because more than 50% of the population of Dallas speak a language other than English. So we decided to roll that in with the, the adults that were coming to that classes because many of these folks would bring their whole family to the library. The adults would go to the class and grandma or abuela would watch the children in the library. So we actively engaged the children while the parents are in class we decided to do something fun with it when we brought them back together. So the children are engaged in STEM, STEAM, SMART, whatever acronym you use, um, to do science projects. Then we bring the parents in, and the parents are challenged to create the science project we've done with the kids, talk about it in English, and then the children judge the, ch the parents' science project. So we call this our flipped science fairs. We also are engaging our, we call them rainbow family days, where we're bringing in families that may not look 
like everybody other's family. So we have your LGBTQ, maybe parents are a different color, but we want them all to come together in the library and see other families that look like them as this is important to us. Next slide. So one thing you might not know about Dallas is we have the largest per capita shopping of any other city in the United States. One of the reasons why I moved there. So it makes sense that we would reach out to our shopping centers and malls as a place to activate family engagement. So we have two locations in the mall. Our first location was open 10 years ago called Bookmarks in North Park Center. This is in our most affluent mall, affluential mall. Um, we're there for free in this space. There's a five-year waiting list to get a store in this space. So, you know, that's, they have Tiffany's and Neiman Marcus and all that, and then we have a little library there. We actually do library programming out in the public area of the mall, not in our store, and we attract three or 400 people on a Saturday or a Sunday to programming. So we have a great opportunity to put the word out about libraries and early literacy and parents being their child's first teacher. The picture you're seeing here is Southwest Center Mall. You might be able to tell that it's a little less affluent. It's in South Dallas. And after our programming in North Park Center, which is in North Dallas, we were um, contacted by the new owner of this location because they wanted to bring families back to the mall. This location had been run down, mostly had sports stores and was getting a very young clientele and they wanted to change the clientele that was coming into the shopping center. They wanted to engage families in this space. So we are partnering with a nonprofit called Big Thought in Dallas to bring in early childhood education to the shopping center in Southwest Center Mall as well. Our book bike goes to every single corner festival and fair in Dallas, and that's another way we engage families. So it's easy to replicate these items in a shopping center because you are bringing in customers. You're the draw, and it's an easy sell to get free space, to get them to sponsor you and do these types of programs. Because when you do the marketing research on this, newspaper picks it up, TV picks it up, and then you're selling and you're bringing in customers. So it's an easy way to gain access and get these, pla these places to partner with you. Next slide. And our last foray is all our partners. So of course we partner with our museums. This is the Dallas Museum of Art. We go in there and do story time every Saturday, our Nasher Sculpture Center as well as Reunion Tower, which is a great big tower downtown, which has a geo deck that looks over the city. And we thought, why would we want to be, do story time there? Most people who go there are visitors to Dallas. They're not going to get a Dallas Public Library card. I don't need to engage them. It's not going to help my return on investment. But actually, we stopped to think about it, and we thought, you know, it is our duty to engage everyone and remind them about being their child's first teacher. So we do go to Reunion Tower and do story time for the visitors to the city of Dallas as well. We're also partnering with lots of nonprofits to bring in programs to the library, like you see, so that families can come together and have a nice Saturday afternoon. So that's it for me, Scott, and I look forward to questions later. Thank you all. Thank you, Joe. Um, I love the idea of the library working with the shopping malls where it's kind of that win-win situation where the library reaches new audiences and gives them quality library services and the business owners are benefiting by the increased traffic. It's just a natural. Um, our next speaker is uh, Pam Joukowsky. Uh, she is the Literacy and Learning Division Director at the Cuyahoga County Public Library. And as the Director of Literacy and Learning, she's responsible for overseeing the quality and standards of all programming held at Cuyahoga County's 27 branches that serve 47 communities in the North Ohio area around Cleveland. Uh, Pam has also been a Children's Services Supervisor, Youth Services Manager, and Branch Manager, and she has her Master in Library and Information Sciences from Kent State University. Thank you, Scott. Imagine a community where over 150,000 adults do not have a high school diploma, where one-third of all the children under the age of six live below the poverty level, where in 2020, just a few years from now, 
only 54% of the jobs can be filled with the current workforce. This is the community that Cuyahoga County Public Library serves. In the Cleveland, Ohio area, there's a dire need to build literacy skills, to build job skills that lead to living wages, and to instill in all a love of learning. And for an organization who supports reading, lifelong learning, and civic engagement, it only makes sense for us to play a role in supporting those efforts through our collection, services, and programs. So at Cuyahoga County Public Library, we have found our two gen programs to be very impactful. We have learned that parents will support their children's learning when they have the knowledge, confidence, and social support. We know that when we provide literacy skills in both the parent and the child at the same time, that the joy of learning is instilled within the family, and then that leads to lifelong learning practices. So if you could show the first slide. Thank you. So these are some of our families that we've been able to impact. So I'm here to share today how we reach those families who really need those types of programs because they're not our traditional library users. So we reach out to them in the community where they live, work, and play. And when you see the one mom with the two children, she's disabled. And we met her at a community event. She had never visited the library before because she had to take the bus in order to get there. So when you're disabled and you need public transportation, it makes the uh, job even twice as difficult. But once we were able to encourage her to come to the library to, to participate in a kindergarten readiness program with her daughter, she is now a library user. She's at the branch probably at least once a week and participates in a number of our programs. We, outreach for us is, is a tool that it's not just a one and done. We don't just go to community events um, and have a program and then that's it, we leave. We're very engaged and we get to know the public that we're serving. We actually do ask them if we can take their name and number and if we can keep them up to date on library programs that are happening in their neighborhoods. This is a way for us to develop a relationship because as you know, when you're dealing with struggling families, they really need time to develop a relationship with you. Also, struggling families, they have other issues that are in keeping them from coming to the library. For example, we had a young homeless mother who was couch surfing at the time that we met her. We met her at a community um, baby shower event. And so she was couch surfing and she was never living, she wasn't living near a branch. And so we just kept in touch with her uh, just by the phone, kept her up to date with new programs that we were offering. And once she moved into an apartment complex very close to one of our branches, she came right away to our baby club program. Now this is a five week program where um, on the very first week, again, this is a struggling mother. She looked very shell shocked. She was very reluctant to participate in the program, and but by the uh, last day of the program, which was the fifth week, so only five weeks later, she was actually joyfully interacting with her child, and she was actually, she led the group singing event. So we really were able to make an impact on her life by just continually to develop a relationship, even if that meant it was happening over the phone. We um, have learned that targeting at-risk families during um, significant childhood transition periods have been very impactful for us also. So keep in mind those periods of time when um, a parent or a child is entering kindergarten. So those struggling families, they seem to be able to prioritize their child's education when those transition periods are happening. So if you go to the next slide, you'll see that during the child's birth is also a significant period of time. And so we offer literacy kits at one of our city hospitals. 
We have literacy volunteers who deliver the kits to new mothers in our maternity ward. Um, not only are there books in the kit, there's a growth chart, there's a health diary, we include a rhyme book, and we also give them a library card. Um, in this hospital, the city hospital, we actually have a library in the hospital, and we'd like the parents to participate and use their library card right away. We also work in partner with the hospital to provide um, parent education classes around every child ready to read. So we provide those early literacy skills to new parents who are participating in the parent education classes that are held at hospitals. We also partner with Reach Out and Read. And in our community, our Reach Out and Read um, pediatricians, they also provide um, referrals to our adult education classes and to our parent engagement classes. So they're not only encouraging families to read together, but they're also connecting them to needed resources so that they can be a healthy family. So if you go to the next slide, thank you. So one of our favorite ways to reach families is to reach them where they play. We've done programs in pools, in playgrounds, in community gardens. And in 2017, uh, Cuyahoga County Public Library was awarded a grant from NCFL to do a program called Let's Learn Together Outside. And we've been able to take that great program and expand it to eight additional communities where we're doing programming outside in parks and community gardens. It's been a very successful program for us. And it's a program format that I think you hear about a lot here at this conference, where um, the families start by uh, gathering together for a brief welcome. Many times we serve some kind of a meal, and then the children leave. So they participate in the children's program while the parents are in, um, in with another library staff member who teaches them a parenting skill. And then we bring the children, the family back together so the parents can practice that skill with the children. And then what we'd like to do is always leave the fam let the families take resources home so they continue to learn at home. This is a program model that we've used for over five years for one of our kindergarten readiness programs, and it's been extremely successful. Not only have we been able to raise literacy, uh, the family parent engagement, but we've been able to raise the academic uh, readiness skills of the children also. Last year, we were able to expand our work uh, working with adults. So we are now the fiscal agent of an adult education program that is funded through VIOA funding from our Ohio Department of Higher Education. So we now offer high school equivalency classes, English as a second language, and citizenship classes. And we've been able to leverage that opportunity and offer those classes at the same time that we offer children's programming. And so um, we found that by working with both the adult and the child at the same time, we've been successful in raising everyone's literacy rates, both the parents and the child's. And in the slide, um, if you go back to the slide, thank you. If you go back to the slide, you'll see that uh, this mother with the two children, uh, we offered a high school equivalency class along with a summer camp. The mother worked third shift, but every morning she'd get up with the two children and she'd come to the library and she would participate in high school equivalency classes while her children were participating in the summer camp. And even though it was a struggle for her, she said it was well worth it. She wanted to model for her children the importance of education. And she also really uh, valued the parent and child time that they got to spend together. So uh, the mother was successful in getting her high school diploma. And the children, uh, we were able to prevent the summer slide with the kids.
One of the other ways that we try to avoid barriers with um, adults so that they can participate in our adult education classes is by offering them out in the community. So we offer many of our classes in K-12 schools. Um, of course, we offer them in libraries. And one of our exciting is that we're going to be offering it in the city hospital again. So it's an opportunity for not only the employees of the hospital to take adult education classes, but it also will be an opportunity for those that live near the hospital for the public. And then on Friday, I'm really excited to share that on Friday, that Cuyahoga County Public Library was awarded a grant or an award by Google. And we have been awarded $50,000 so that we can buy mobile hotspots for our adult learners. So our adult learners now will be able to take a mobile hotspot home and they can continue their education taking advantage of adult online education while they're at home. So now they'll have access to high-speed internet. Now we have an opportunity to double our money if we get enough votes by Friday. So I'm going to ask all of you to go to cuyahogalibrary.org slash Google and vote for us because if we have the most votes by Friday, we'll be able to double the number of hotspots that we can provide our adult learners. So in closing, what I'd like to say is that I feel that public libraries are trusted institutions that serve all ages and meet people where they are, placing us in a perfect position to support family literacy and engagement. As the required skills of our labor force continues to grow, literacy is essential. And as the work continues to change, lifelong learning is necessary. In response, Cuyahoga County Public Library is shifting from simply providing the materials for learning to providing learning experiences, not only for individuals, but for the entire family. Thank you. Thank you, Pam, and congratulations on your Google Award, and I'm sure we'll all be going online to vote for Cuyahoga County. So our next speaker is Ellen Clore, and Ellen is the Family Literacy Librarian at the Santa Clara City Library. Um, she's the Family Literacy Librarian for Read Santa Clara, the adult literacy program at the City of Santa Clara Library, and has created preschool family math workshops, a website of local parenting and early learning resources, and co-authored a book, From Literacy to Life Skills, Library Services for Teen Parents, which was published in 2011. In 2016, Ellen was selected as runner-up for NCFL's Family Literacy Teacher of the Year. Congratulations. She has her Master in Library and Information Science from Simmons College. Thank you, Scott. And thank you all for being here this afternoon and all the people that are watching the webcast, too. I'd like you to think about an event in your life that was really happy, maybe a wedding or a family reunion or a special birthday, um, an event where the, well, I like to say the joy was bouncing off the walls. And I am so lucky because that is what my family literacy programs are like many, many times a month. And it isn't just me, it's also the wonderful families that we work with. Can you, next slide please? We um, are so lucky to be able to give these families time to be together without any outside pressures or feeling any responsibilities and to just enjoy being together and learning as a family. And I have want to tell a couple little stories. I'm really a storyteller. Um, all of the kids that are in the slide doing the finger painting, that isn't really shaving cream or finger paint. It's bubble mix. What happened was we had a bubble program and the bubble mix was sort of a disaster. And I can say that because I made the bubble mix. But the kids took whisks and egg beaters and beat it until it was like whipped cream. And I don't know, I really can't remember if I suggested it or it was their idea, but all of a sudden, 
that whole table, they dumped all of this bubble stuff on it and they were madly finger painting with it and the energy was so great, it was really fun. Now I have to apologize, there's no parents in the picture. That's because this is one where they were standing back and they were all thanking us for doing this with their kids so they didn't have to do it at home. <laughs> so we um, work with teen parents, migrant families, families that are living in transitional housing, including uh, women who are at a, a, a center for victims of domestic violence. And in the last couple of years, we've also started working with low income preschools. 98% of our programs are out at our group sites. Um, we've done programs in teachers lounges, classrooms, daycare centers, rec rooms, living rooms, the school district's boardroom, wherever our groups come, that's where we are too. And many, many of our programs are also in the evening because that's when parents are available. Our programs are all grant funded. We've been going for 12 years and our friends and foundation find local grants for us from organizations and corporations and also national grants. And we also have had funding from individuals. We use the uh, parent and child together time as our basic model, but we work really hard at making our programs fit the needs of the group that we're working with. Um, and sometimes we have to really adjust what we're doing based on our group. Up in the upper corner, you can see my friend Janelle. She's a master gardener. And every year we like to take teen parents around on a walk through a community garden. And the first couple times that we did it, it didn't really go over as well as we had hoped it would. And it took a while for us to realize that the parents themselves were very new to seeing uh, plants growing in the ground. They hadn't experienced that before. So when we took them and their children around together, the parents were processing all of this information themselves and they weren't really able to share it with their children. So we revised our program and started taking the parents around first, modeling for them how to show their children what they were seeing and then we would get the children and they would take over for us and uh, it went much better. Although I have to admit there were chickens in a chicken coop and the chickens always won out over the broccoli for sure. <laughs> So um, I want to talk about two aspects of the programming I do that are very special to me. One is storytelling and the other one is uh, crafts. I never know what age people are going to show up to my programs. I can have little kids, I can have school age kids, I can have teens and parents and all over the place. And I found that storytelling really is a great way to to kind of bridge that gap between all of those ages, especially participatory uh, storytelling. I like to tell folk tales from all over the world using puppets often with them. And what'll happen is I'll tell the story with the puppets and then we let the kids and the parents come up and they act out the puppets while I tell the story. And sometimes my assistant has to like pull me off the stage after we told the story four or five times so everybody had a chance to use the puppets. Children love to see their parents acting silly and doing things that they normally never see them do. And when I was preparing this talk, I thought back on a time when I had a lady who chased me around the room with a cat puppet. We were, <laughs> we were doing Old McDonald. So I was Old McDonald and I given all the parents all the animal puppets. So I came up and I was like Old McDonalding her singing the song and, and that sort of thing. And all of a sudden the cat like went like this at me. And I must have screamed or shrieked or something because all of a sudden we were like running around the room. <laughs> I don't quite know how it happened, but it really, um, it really brought the house down. I love to do crafts. I'm a maker myself and there's been a, so much written about the therapeutic value of crafts and you really see it when you have a room of parents and children together and I don't know, there's a big collective sigh, everybody starts to relax and then there's a happy buzz in the room. It's a, a great opportunity for parents to work with their younger children on something together that isn't serious. And um, 
again, it's a great thing for all ages. Although that's the big challenge with the crafts is figuring out something that will work for everyone. I like to use everyday materials in uh, my crafts, Think, things like glue sticks and construction paper and string, things that I hope will be e more easily accessible to the families themselves at home. Also found that simple things are best. One of our most uh, successful crafts were greeting cards. I just had some blank greeting cards left over from a failed project of my own at home. Brought them in. We had a lot of art materials. And I like to give people a prompt when I'm doing something like that um, because I call it um, creativity within a structure. A lot of times the first step, getting an idea, really holds people back. So if you give them just a simple framework to do the craft within, it kind of releases their creativity to make it their own. In this case, I would just give them a prompt like write um, make a card to say thank you to someone or make a card for someone that is special to you. And we were doing this uh, project with the migrant family group, and that's quite a large group. We usually have about at least 75 parents and children. And one of the volunteers noticed that one of the dads was making a card that said RIP, rest in peace, and had a cross on it. And we asked around, and it turned out that the previous week, his nephew had been hit by a car while riding his bike and had died. And of course, it was incredibly disturbing. But on the other hand, we also were really glad that we were able to give him a, an opportunity to work through his grief a little bit and create something that he could share with other people in his family. So sometimes the results of what you do, you just kind of never expect what they're going to be. Um, could we have the next slide, please? This is the family math workshop that I um, developed. I just found out this morning that I'm part of a movement, a math for young children movement. That's pretty exciting. Um, this is based on what my husband used to do with my daughter when she was growing up. They used to spend a lot of time sorting and counting poker chips. And then as she got a little bit older, my daughter learned to do addition from playing 21 with my husband. Now, no gambling was allowed, but other than that, it worked out really well. And again, I wanted to uh, create something that used household materials. So just about everything we bought, you can see the materials that are in the math kit there. Um, is You can get at Target or at Walmart. And then I wrote up a 12-page um, guide that we also had translated into Spanish. And in it, I had different ideas for using the materials and using them in different combinations. I also included ideas for using them with older siblings, because I know that in many instances, the older siblings spend a lot of time playing with the, with the children, too. And since I, so I won't forget, the URL on the slide is, uh, if you go there, you can locate all the materials. The, you're welcome to use the guide. You're welcome to use the list to um, do your own math workshops. And you can see from the photos uh, some of the activities that we did there, a lot of sorting, a lot of counting. Um, I have to say that the most popular were was the throw the dice, count the dots, get as many goldfish as you got dots, and then eat them if you want, or save them for later if you want. And we did three sessions, three workshops. I, I led them because we tried stations, and for our group, stations weren't working that well. So I led them through two or three of the activities using each of the materials, because I wanted the parents to go home feeling confident that they could do this with their children. And I also wanted them to see how much you can learn and how much fun you can have with play. Next slide, please. This is one of my real favorites. This is um, some of the bookmaking I've done with teen parents. Again, so I won't forget, there's the URL to, to get the information. And um, I do bookmaking with all of the groups that I work with, but uh, teen parents are really a challenge because they're working very hard to be parents, 
but they're still teenagers. And sometimes those two roles don't fit very well with one another. So when I can find an activity that kind of satisfies both of them, I'm really happy about it. And this bookmaking definitely does. I'm always looking for ways to connect them in a deeper way to books. And I found that making a book kind of forces you to really get in and understand what a book is about. Now, I know you, what you're thinking. You're thinking, how can she get them to write books? Writing books is really hard. I couldn't write a book if somebody told me to write a book. And you're totally right. So what I've done is I've developed story formats. Again, the idea of creativity within a structure that they can use to create their books. And in doing that, I'm also able to in include an early learning practice in the format of what the book ends up being so that they're doing an early learning um, activity at the same time that they're reading the book to the child. So you can see in these two, the top one is, um, is one where you spell out your, the child's name and um, like E is for Easter, N is for necklace. And I have to say, I love the way the parent did the necklace out of buttons on that one. I thought that was really clever. And so the children are going to get a little phonemic awareness. They're going to learn how to spell their name. And they have something that is really special to them because it's about them. The book on the bottom is one of our Lift the Flat books. When we make a lift to the flat book, we use felt for the flaps and we stick them down with duct tape so that they're not going anywhere. And you can see this is a little riddle book about insects and animals. I have another book format that really is one of my favorites. And so I won't forget this either. I have samples over at the table. So when we're done, if anyone would like to come take a look, I'd be happy to share them with you. Called the You and Me book. And it's a comparison between the parent and the child. Um, my eyes are brown. Your eyes are green. I like to eat ice cream. You like to eat crackers. I have a, a whole list of prompts that they can choose from. And why I find this is important for the teen parents is that they often lead very chaotic lives and they really get very few opportunities to reflect on who their child is. And this is a, a way that they're able to do that and they end up again with a wonderful book that's a memory of who they were and who their child was at that particular time in their lives. Um, and the joy that we experience when the children are, when the teens read these books as children, it's, it's just really uh, great. And whenever the teens write us thank you notes about the things we've done, they always mention the bookmaking. I have three hopes for the families that I work with that I think all of us probably have for the families and family literacy that, that we work with. Um, the first is that their children will be successful in school when they start school. The second is that we are able to create a culture, uh, help them create a culture of reading and learning in their families. And the third, of course, for us as librarians is that they'll feel connected through us to the library and move towards starting to use the library's resources that we all know can be so significant in improving the quality of their lives. Thank you so much. I'm so glad this is over. <laughs> Thank you, Ellen. Um, and you know Ellen must be doing something right at their library because she mentioned teens writing thank you notes, which is kind of, kind of amazing. Um, our last speaker is Kelvin Watson. He's the director of the Broward County Library here in Florida. Um, he was named director in February of 2017. And prior to that, he was the chief operating officer and senior vice president for the Queens Library in New York. He's the immediate past president of the Black Caucus of the American Library Association. And he is also a director at large on the PLA Board of Directors, so I get to work with Calvin in that capacity. Um, he's the recipient of the 2017 Demco ALA Black Caucus Award for Excellence in Librarianship and was just nominated as a top finalist for a 2018 Route 50 Navigator Award, which honors government officials who implement great ideas. So Calvin, come on up. And please remember, you have comment cards and question cards. We're going to try and get to as many as we can, but even if we don't, we'd love to see your questions. Thank you, Scott. Good afternoon, everybody. It's, uh, it's interesting that I'm going last, as Wat my last name is Watson, and also I've got to follow uh, a very lovely group of librarians. 
uh, and also we'll be able to kind of, I think, wrap up what they've talked about and, of course, talk a little bit about some of the programming that we're doing at the Broward County Libraries. So some of the things that we're doing at the Broward County Libraries, and, and Scott mentioned the Route 50 Award, is that we try to invite the uninvited. How many of you have felt like you have been uninvited or unwelcome? So the goal of the Broward County Libraries is to do that with all of our innovative programming, both inside and outside the library, really breaking down the barriers for families to, uh, to connect with, with the library. So we're, uh, we're offering tablets that you can borrow from the library. We've preloaded them and made them family ready with resources for uh, job uh, skills and resume building. Uh, we also have partnered with the schools to have their resources loaded on the devices as well. We also are working with veterans and lending hotspots. So again, I'm interested in I'm wrapping up where we chose veterans because we could holistically focus on veterans and their families and their dependents. So we're doing some of those things. We, we partner with the Broward County Public Schools to offer a digital direct library card to offer them direct access to the resources at the Broward County uh, Library System. So our goals are really about um, bridging the digital divide, breaking down the barriers, and also inviting the uninvited and making people feel welcome. Next slide. So one of the things that we have recently, we recently run a, we recently won a, a grant from the state for a new project called Project Welcome. And it's to focus on our, the immigrant families that are coming here, primarily you know, here in Broward County. Broward County is where we are now. I'm, so I uh, didn't have to travel far to get here. But the serving the immigrant families, so we're focusing on um, Spanish, Haitian, Creole, and Portuguese families welcoming them, introducing them to our libraries, introducing them to our library resources. We've created a welcome ambassador program where we have volunteers who speak the native languages of the folks who are coming here uh, and working with them to help them transition into the, to the library. So again, leveraging that physical space, but also working to lend those things like the tablets and the other things that uh, connect them um, digitally as well. So if they are, if they don't want to come to the library, one of my things is the library is everywhere. The library can be everywhere, and so that's the uh, that's the way that we're connecting. So um, this is a new pro a new project. Actually, it was just approved by the county commission this morning. <laughs> so uh, we'll be launching this and working with uh, working with. Uh, with these families and um, a lot of the libraries who, um, the public libraries here in, in the state of Florida actually are looking at this as a model and how it works out for, uh, works out for us. Next slide. So one of the other ways that we connect, and I'm, I'm, I'm focused on focusing on time because I want to leave some time for questions. So again, I'm a good wrap up person. Uh, literacy help centers. Uh, so we have four literacy uh, help centers that we um, provide English um, um, language programs for adults. We also um, have our Career Online High School wrapped into our literacy programs as well. So making computers available, technology training for families. Um, again, the family, that's what we're here talking about, the, the, the bringing the, uh, uh, all of our programs holistically not focused on any one group but the families. Um, and again, we, we just recently won a, a small grant from the Sun Sentinel, which is a local uh, newspaper here, to actually offer additional some additional computers as well. Next slide. And one of the newest things that I wanted to talk about is the new pilot program that we're uh, going to be launching in the next few weeks. We are, um, we're calling the pop-up libraries. It's a new community engagement program that's going to be offered, uh, encouraging reading throughout the community. So as I said, reaching people where they are, inviting the uninvited. How many of us go to the DMV and stay for hours? 
wouldn't it be great if you could connect to the library while you were at the DMV waiting? What about at uh, your local coffee shop? So don't have to go to Starbucks to read their material. You can connect to the Broward County libraries. Again, you don't come to the library, the library will come to you. Um, it's a new concept and we're early adopter of this program and uh, looking forward to it being uh, successful. So for families, um, you know, the, and, and, my, and my colleagues talked about this earlier, that the library is a, is a, is a safe place, right? We are the place where people come and make everyone, uh, make everyone welcome. But again, if you feel like you're, um, if you feel like you're uninvited, or if you don't know if the library is for you, it is. We are welcoming you. We are inviting the uninvited. So I'm going to wrap with that, and uh, so we can get right to the to the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Kelvin, and I'm going to ask all the speakers to come on up and um, stand up here so we can get some questions done before we have, have to wrap up in a few minutes. Um, and the first question I'm going to ask is, uh, we know from uh, working in the library that some families never come into the library, and even when you go out to the, um, the community, into shopping malls or around Broward County, some parents and families are, and adults are just harder to engage. They have barriers. So what do, you, what do you suggest to libraries when you encounter those parents? How do you really get them to engage, even when you've already gone all the way out into the community to try to do that? I would say, you know, you find things that are relatable and interesting. One of the, you know, I talked about the tablets that we are lending. So we're, we were having some trouble in one of the areas lending out the tablets. So um, I'm not sure how much you are familiar, are familiar with those things called the Merge Cube. So it's a little app that you can download and actually then takes and makes the, um, the application virtual reality. So I think that's one way you make it you make it interesting for the parent who then you know also uh, include the the children yep. at Southwest Center Mall, the second mall I mentioned, um, the mall owner wanted us to do exactly the same program we were doing at North Park Center, but after we got into the mall, we found quickly that there um, was a different need in the mall so what we did was say, yes, we would do the program he wanted if you'll let us do the program we want to do, which was doing um, job um, resources and GED training in the site as well. So he ended up giving us additional space to do things because we actually listened to the community and what they wanted from us. So it's, um, I think it's super important most libraries do listen to the community and respond to what they want. So not being cookie cutter, but really trying to identify the, right. the critical needs that are going to bring them to the table. Any other thoughts from the other? I think that one of the things that um, we may need to make sure that the community is aware of is our online resources, right? So, so we have a vast amount of online resources that by a community member may not be may not realize may not have access to actually traveling to the library but would have access to those resources so we just have to remember to connect them to those resources great so another question um, i know you've all worked hard in your libraries to kind of change the mindset and bring family engagement more into the library we heard we heard joe talk about in dallas moving the children's and the adult services staff together to collaborate What's it been like trying to get library staff on board? Have you met any resistance? Has it, has it been the concept been clear to them or have they really had to make a, a mindset shift? Well, I think that when you start telling the library staff some of the stories about the people you work with, they are so heart-wrenching that it brings out the best in people and people start to see that there's tremendous value in what you're trying to do. We also did some really targeted training with our staff and partnered them because there's nothing scarier than sending an adult librarian into a children's program and they're like, I don't like kids. But the same response really happens is once they get in there and start engaging with the families, um, they really connect and then they get that warm fuzzy. So training and preparing the staff, I think is the best start. And, and I also think physical space can help a lot. We have designated quiet areas at the Nashville Public Library. So the default is that it is not a shh 
zone that you, if you need peace and quiet, that we have special rooms just for that. And so that kind of shifts people's mindsets. One of the things that I, that I think is um, sort of that leading by example. So I'm not a children's librarian, as you can probably tell, um, but through our, uh, we had a, our daddy story time and I went out and read to the, to the children and also uh, am currently doing a uh, director's book, uh, book talks across the county. So I think leading by example and showing that, you know, from, from us, the, the leadership that we're uh, doing it as well. So lots of strategies. You have internal training, you have some internal advocacy going on, you've got shifting the physical space, you've got being an example for other staff. Hopefully that gets everybody on board. Um, another question, similar uh, in working with community organizations, I imagine there are some that are just like, yeah, come on, let's do it. And then there's others that maybe don't understand why you want to get into their space or what you're going to offer or, or why you're trying to be outside the library or still think the library is just about books. So. What kind of challenges have you encountered in working with community partner organizations? Well, I'll say that when we first approached our museums and our sculpture garden to do story time, they were a, li a little apprehensive about having groups of children um, coming into the space. And so we actually partnered with them to develop some of their educational programs and reach out to the city and through the schools. And as the partnership has grown, they the arts partners are now coming into the library and doing programs as well as us going into their space and doing programs. So I think it was a little bit of education for both of us um, and inviting them into our space and seeing how we can be more valuable together. I would say the exact same thing that, that Joe said. We, we had a program um, earlier this year called Chalk Lit. It was a chalk and literature fe festival. We partnered with the arts community, we had chalk artists come in and draw on the sidewalk outside the library. And we had over 5,000 people show up on a Saturday afternoon for this event. So we now are, you know, partners definitely want to partner with us. We actually are moving that program to another library in another one of the cities this year. I totally want to do that now. <laughs> I just learned something new. Uh, one of the things that we found we need to do is be really flexible. Uh, we have to fit in the organization's time frame. And what usually happens is they may be reluctant at first, but when they see the response from their community group, then they become much more enthusiastic about what we're doing. But um, we are we have to get in when they want us and i am so lucky i have an assistant who's incredibly tenacious about getting back to um, the people that we work with and getting um, our program scheduled Great. we have one more question and I, maybe you all can answer this one um so do you all, obviously we have some shining stars here who are speaking um but how does it work from a staff perspective do you already have staff whose job it is to coordinate all these programs are you hiring or thinking of creating specific positions around family engagement um, i think that staff capacity is probably a big issue for lots of libraries so how are you all making it work I can tell you a few years ago, we actually realigned most of our positions at Dallas Public Library to include this. So we are hiring new positions just to do this type of engagement. And we actually, don't tell people at ALA this guy, <laughs> but we actually are hiring people with skills other than library skills to work in the library. And that's been our target. We'll always have librarians, but we're actually targeting musicians and artists and graphic artists and writers to come in and teach in the library. I know, right? But don't tell ALA. <laughs> we'll always have librarians, but we're looking for those other skills. And I would say it's the same at Nashville Public Library. Um, Clem Marie and I both do not come from library backgrounds. And actually, my whole department bringing books to life, none of us are library people. We're all educators and come from diverse. A lot of us have arts backgrounds. Um, and I would say the same. We're part of the library's community engagement and education division. And I would say of all the managers in that division, I think only one, maybe two, actually have library degrees. Everybody else comes from another field. Yes, of course. 
So at Cuyahoga County Public Library, I would say that we probably have more of a traditional approach, um, but we do do hire a lot of folks with educator backgrounds, artist backgrounds for our paraprofessional positions. And then of course we encourage them to get their master's degree. Um, but we're spending a lot of time training our children's and teen librarians around parent engagement because of course that's a little bit different than a children's program. So we've had children's programs, we've done every child ready to read, but now we're really moving more towards this other model, right? So where they're actually having to have conversations with parents while the other children's librarian is doing the children's program. So it's a little bit different for them, but we're doing that through training. We're doing it through training. They get an opportunity to shadow another staff member who has has experience doing that. And they were also using what, we're, what we call them coaches. So we have hired um, professional consultants who have experience doing this. And they're actually in the room and they're um, giving um, our staff coaching. So as things are going afterwards, they're giving them, spending some time with them, talking about like, you know, think about that you could have um, suggested to that parent that they could have done this. Or think about, I think you need to be more intentional with that parent. The parent is still sitting off to the side. So you need to intentionally say to that parent, here's a toy and go sit down with your child and try that activity. So kind of coaching them. Uh, coaching our staff through that process. So we're, we're really working towards a very pro, pro, pretty progressive um, uh, training for our staff. Great. Well, thank you very much. I want to thank all of our speakers one more time for giving a great, great presentation. So thank you very much. Um, and I think I'm going to turn it over to Emily to make a few closing comments. And I would just encourage everyone in the audience here and online to stay connected to NCFL and to PLA because we want to keep working on this with you and hear all your great stories. So thank you. And thank you, Scott. Um, we really appreciate you moderating today and we appreciate the partnership with PLA. And we want to thank the presenters again for sharing the examples of the ways they're reaching out to serve the needs of their patrons to help us come up with new ideas for our patrons. Um, thank you to the audience, both here and, and the one online. Um, we had some great questions, and the ones that we weren't able to get to, we'll try and address after the fact if we have a way to reach out to you. We want to thank the Urban Libraries Council for its ongoing support of NCFL. And again, thank Better World Books for its sponsorship and its ongoing commitment to supporting literacy initiatives. Um, if you want to show the last slide. Um, we encourage you to sign up for our mailing list to learn about future library opportunities with NCFL. By filling this out and submitting this form, um, it'll help us connect you with the latest information on NCFL's library work and any grant competitions that we may have. So uh, feel free to do that and you'll also be among the first people to learn about 2019's Camp Wonderopolis and opportunities for libraries there. So thank you again for joining us today. I appreciate it. I know we ran a little late, so I'm sorry about that. <laughs>